In some sense, I was told by virtually all of the adults of my life growing up that school was good for my mind, that it would make me a better thinker, and now I have come to believe the exact opposite is true. I think schools increase closed-minded thinking, ideological prejudice, confirmation bias. That's Dylan Selterman. Today, we explore the possibility that the crisis of the lack of free inquiry and viewpoint diversity on many campuses is not due to a malfunction of higher education, but a direct product of the university system itself. I'm Zach Rausch. This is Heterodox Out Loud. Our guest today is Dylan Selterman, social personality psychologist and an associate teaching professor at Johns Hopkins University. He writes a blog for Psychology Today called The Resistance Hypothesis and hosts a podcast with his colleague Manuel Galvin called A Bit More Complicated. He's a supporter of democratic schooling and wide-ranging educational reform. He argues that without major structural changes, higher education will continue struggling in promoting the values that Heterodox Academy upholds, open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement. Before we chat, let's listen to Dylan's blog post that he wrote in 2018 on our website. It's called, Curiosity is One Key to Heterodoxy. Forced Memorization is Not. Read by Richard Davies. Research shows that intellectual curiosity and openness to ideas are important for academic success. These traits are also relevant for heterodoxy. That is, the more curious people are, the more they will be appreciative of different viewpoints. Studies show that curiosity, but not knowledge, predicts bipartisan attitude convergence about environmental threats such as climate change. Thus, curiosity should be the cornerstone of pedagogy and heterodoxy. Most listeners probably won't object to this idea, but unfortunately, curiosity is de-emphasized in most contemporary educational environments, while rote memorization and high-stakes testing are prioritized to the detriment of students' well-being. Most modern university courses function in a top-down, hierarchical manner, where the teacher acts as an ideological authority figure, forcing information into students' minds through mandatory readings, lectures, assignments, and exams. Most schools create a coercive learning atmosphere, where students feel they have no choice but to obey, lest they receive low marks on their transcripts that may diminish future prospects. Students' intrinsic goals matter little in course design, and curiosity is largely absent from learning outcomes. Advocates for educational alternatives have noted this type of academic environment is not only ineffective, but also perhaps immoral. But what would an alternative educational model look like? Student-driven learning. Democratic schools emphasize freedom of academic inquiry as well as social equality between students and faculty. There is no such thing as a singular truth in such a school because truth and knowledge are recognized as fluid constructs. Therefore, teachers never force their students to memorize facts or ideas, and students feel free to respectfully engage with their peers and treat teachers as equals. There is no standardized enforced curriculum either, because students are free to develop their own educational paths through their sense of curiosity. Education reformer and academic Daniel Greenberg argued that democracy relies on the free expression of ideas, free assembly, and equality of opportunity. These principles ought to be built into schools because schools are a good rehearsal space for democratic norms. Greenberg and his colleagues went on to found the Sudbury Valley School, which has, for many worldwide, become a model for intellectual freedom and curiosity. Some colleges and universities have adopted these principles into their pedagogical focus. For example, the New College of Florida does not assign letter-numbered grades, instead allowing students to shape their individualized curriculum based on their own curiosity and interests. 
At Deep Springs College, this is taken to an even further extreme, with students having control over admissions, faculty hiring, and other aspects of governance and administration. The documentary film Ivory Tower showcases what this type of academic community looks like, and it is strikingly different from most universities. Students not only are rigorously engaging with their coursework, but they also learn how to constructively communicate and disagree with each other. Former student Daniel Leibovitz is quoted as saying, The main attraction of Deep Springs for me was self-governance, having to compromise with people and having to put myself in other people's positions. And I don't think that's something natural for us. That has to be taught. In a dialogue with a different student, Joel Schlosser, a professor, remarked, Every time I come in here and I say, What do you think about this? Do you want to change these assignments? How do you like these readings? I'm trying to give you opportunities for agency. The purpose of this place is for you to create what you want here. The problem is that for you to get what you want, you've got to cooperate with other people, which means trying to figure out a way to communicate your anger without being antagonistic. Can you imagine what this would look like at your institution? Would you enjoy working in a department where there is no required curriculum or coursework for undergraduates, no multiple choice exams, and no letter number grades? Or if those elements are present, they would be determined through democratic exercise, where students and faculty have equal voices and power in the decision-making process. Should students be allowed to design their own courses, select their own course readings, and assess their own academic achievements? Reinforcing Orthodoxy Heterodox Academy was built by scholars who were concerned about specific problems that our colleges and universities are suffering from, including intolerance for diverse opinions and fears of dissent and disagreement that quell otherwise productive speech. Some proposed solutions involve correcting for underrepresentation of ideological minorities, as well as creating tools to help students engage with each other regarding potentially sensitive or politicized topics. But another possibility is that the authoritarian construction of universities themselves is at the root of these problems, and these problems go hand in hand with the problem of students' stifled curiosity. Standard instructional practices may actually be steering students towards narrow-mindedness and intolerance. A recent analysis shows that more education is linked with greater prejudice toward those with different ideological viewpoints. This is exactly the opposite of what we want schools to do. Students are socialized to value their own knowledge, much of which is temporary, which is reinforced by the mandatory assessments given to students— Walking out of classrooms with exam grades of A's and B's can give students an overinflated sense of confidence in their own knowledge or abilities relative to others, which can be detrimental to intellectual humility and curiosity. Recent studies have shown that college GPA is negatively correlated with students' motivation to be creative and innovative. But academic achievement is positively correlated with intellectual arrogance. The better students perform, the more narrow-minded they become. A commonly held belief is that schools promote enlightened thinking. But why would that be the case? As educational historians note, schools were created to accomplish the reverse, to indoctrinate students and to promote obedience to authority figures. Some early proponents of compulsory schooling were religious zealots who believed that children were born with original sin and forced them to memorize Bible verses in classrooms. These methods, lectures plus rote memorization, are still commonly utilized in colleges today. In the wake of the Enlightenment, the focus shifted toward secular topics such as mathematics, chemistry, history, literature. But the methods remain strikingly similar. Instead of indoctrinating students to be subservient to religious institutions, the goal shifted to make students subservient to the state, the military, and future employers. School was designed to impede 
free expression and stifle independent thought. No wonder professors and students feel inhibited to express controversial or unorthodox viewpoints. While it's true that academic researchers are genuinely interested in free inquiry and discovery in their work, this often melts away when we step into the classroom and students are coerced into taking exams, reading books, or writing essays on topics they don't enjoy simply because the faculty value them. These methods are the antithesis of curiosity and free expression, which are central to our goals of promoting heterodoxy. Instead, universities ought to be truly democratic institutions. Students should retain full agency and autonomy in their academic goals, as well as power, through self-governance, to shape the policies and procedures of their community. Richard Davies reading Dylan Selterman's blog post, Curiosity is one key to heterodoxy. Forced memorization is not. Now my discussion with Dylan. Dylan, thank you for coming on to Heterodox Out Loud. I'm uh, really happy to get to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me a little bit about your story, uh, your academic story, and how you became interested in some of the topics that you were writing about? Well, I'll start off by saying that I don't have personal experience with alternative schools or alternative education. I have uh, only experience with mainstream schools, which feel kind of miserable to me. And looking back, I think of myself as a pretty naive student who basically believed in the general goodness of school, despite the fact that I felt it was a, a source of suffering. And I believed then I believed, you know, one day in the future would all make sense. Like I would wake up one day in my 20s or 30s with a moment of clarity. Ah, so that's why they forced me to memorize the quadratic formula. But of course, that, that day never came and it never will. Um, and and my, my interest in alternatives started when I read critiques of mainstream education from fields like psychology, which is my field, along with sociology and anthropology. A few books stand out, Free to Learn by Peter Gray, Schools on Trial by Nikhil Goyle. I mentioned both of those in my blog post. And I Love Learning, I Hate School by Susan Bloom is another good one. Those are folks who are suggesting alternative approaches to education, which I think we should all take seriously. What's the connection between your interest in alternative schools and how did that tie you to Heterodox Academy? Yeah, I, I became interested in HXA when I saw leaders in my field taking up the cause. I've been inspired by folks like John Haidt, Chris Martin, Musa Garbi, Deb Mashek, and many others. I think freedom of inquiry and intellectual diversity are the cornerstones of any progressive, egalitarian, enlightened society. Those should be the values of the academy, in my view. Um, it, it is a strange moment we're in now where ideas like free speech and diversity of thought are being more aligned with uh, the right wing of the American culture war. The, these are liberal values, and I feel strongly that we need to stand up for them. And I love the programming that HXA does. I like what you're doing with you know, the conferences, the blog, this podcast. I think these conversations are so important to have. Give us the rundown of your argument for alternative schools and why it really helps promote the values that HXA espouses. I'm going to apologize in advance if I seem a little overly emotional about this topic. I have, I have a lot of feelings about it, anger in particular. I, I feel like in some sense, I was told by uh, you know, virtually all of the adults of my life growing up that school was good for my mind, that it would make me a better thinker. And now I have come to believe the exact opposite is true. I think schools increase closed-minded thinking, ideological prejudice, confirmation bias. And now in 2022, I think on an ethical level, we ought to be focusing on education reform because I think we're really failing our students and doing a major disservice in mainstream schooling. I desperately want this to change. School ideally is a place where community members can come together to practice self-governance, to create constitutions of knowledge and discourse, to borrow the phrase from Jonathan Rauch. Um, all of this in a way that parallels the type of broader society that we're striving to create, where we're all treated as equals and have the same basic rights. 
Uh, right now in mainstream schools, students don't have the same rights as faculty, staff, and administration. And I, I think that is deplorable. When there is this hierarchical authoritarian relationship where the students have little, if any, control over what information they're being given and what goes into their minds, I think that is detrimental to all of the goals that HXA is striving for. But within higher ed, tell me, like, what is the ideal vision that you see of how institutions should be structured in a way that would fulfill these democratic values? Well, the ideal for me would be something that captures our democratic values. And I think for some folks, they hear the message of reform and they think, oh, well, this means we're going to get rid of exams. We're going to get rid of grades. We're going to you know, completely top down reform the whole of the structure. So you can still have quizzes or grades, but the real benefit would be for the students to have those things in order for them to accomplish their learning goals. I'm not opposed to those things. The problem I see is that students don't want to do those things now. Like as, you know, the, the average student who's enrolled in higher ed does not want to take exams. And in some cases, they don't want to go to class. They don't want to receive grades. And this is not healthy. This is not good for learning. It's kind of like if you go to the doctor, the doctor says, you're unhealthy, you need to make lifestyle changes. And your response is, no, I don't want to. That makes no sense. What we need to remember is that the desire to learn and grow and explore, this is a very instinctual biological process that's part of a healthy human mind. We're born with it. You don't need to force people to learn things no more than you need to force them to eat or drink or sleep or have sex. And so we, we have this natural urge through curiosity and open-mindedness, which I think is just as strong as those other drive states. So that, I think, should be the central premise for school. If I want to learn about a topic or if I want to learn a skill, I value critical feedback from instructors. I value their expertise. I value their guidance. That should be, I think, our working model for all levels of education. At Heterodox Academy, we conduct what we call the Campus Expression Survey, and we, we just launched it actually yesterday. And for listeners, that would be March 1st. And one of the findings that we've been showing, and there have been some other reports from other organizations, is that within the past five, 10 years, we've seen a large spike in self-censorship among students, really a rising crisis in free inquiry and viewpoint diversity. Reading your piece, it sounds like this is like a deep systemic issue that maybe has always been a problem in higher ed. Yeah, thanks. This is a great question. And I certainly don't mean to dismiss the results of those survey findings. I think those are very, very valuable in, in terms of helping to diagnose and come up with solutions to this problem. I think this is probably, though, one of the areas where I diverge a bit from this line of thinking that we're dealing with a new problem. I, I'm not convinced because I think in some sense, maybe the problem was manifesting differently. And in general, I think in society, we have pretty short memories. We're living in a time where people are maybe over-exaggerating the problems we face now relative to the ones we faced in, um, in recent history. I mean, not too long ago, I, I remember what it was like to be a student in high school in the 90s and then in college in the early 2000s. And there were, there were rules about what ideas were off limits and the divisions were mainly about culture war stuff. I remember what it was like to see extreme professional consequences for taboo expressions. And I don't think that our social life in America today is really fundamentally different than it was 15 or 20 years ago. This was at the height of the war on terror. And while this was happening, you know, students and faculty were, were walking on eggshells. We we're walking on eggshells egg then and we're walking on eggshells now. We want to fit in. Uh, you know, we're human. We don't want to upset other people, but I think we, we also want to explore and better understand our world. So there's an inherent tension in that. And maybe this tension manifests a bit differently now compared to a few decades ago, but I think it's always been with us to some extent. Right. And I do think that probably social media has also 
change the dynamics. But I think you you are talking about it also another deeper issue of, and I'd like you to talk a little more about how the structure of institutions themselves are leading to closed mindedness. Well, I think there's high stakes when students are told by their teachers and administrators that we are scrutinizing all of your work, we're evaluating the things that you say, and we're keeping score. And any failures will go on your record. And there could be really extreme consequences for you in the future based on your performance here now in the classroom or on your exams. You're creating an environment that I think is not only bad for mental health, but bad for people to think creatively, to think critically, to challenge what they're told, to not necessarily be afraid to make mistakes. And the what you're hinting at in terms of how things operate on social media, it's it's kind of the same thing. You know, you 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 maybe write something a bit awkwardly and then a bunch of people pounce on you. That happens in school too. You know, you you screw up an exam and all of a sudden you're feeling like, well, am I going to pass this semester? Am I going to get the job that I want? Am I going to lose my my scholarship? And there is no room for humanness. So for people who are listening to this podcast, they maybe they agree with you, maybe they don't, but regardless, what advice would you give to professors to encourage more curiosity in the classroom and, and to make this a reality within the institutions that we're working in? There's no reason we can't create an ideal or optimal model for learning every college or university. I, I'm still an optimist. And so my best advice would be to really try to infuse everything that you're doing with democratic processes. Encourage folks to serve on campus committees or campus governance. And if you're listening, I encourage you personally to serve in some capacity yourself. And, and please don't tell me that you don't have time. All of us need to be active citizens in our communities, and that includes our campus communities. And what about to, uh, to students who are listening? Same thing. Get active, get involved, know who your campus reps are. You elected them. Go and talk to the people whose job it is to represent your concerns and your values and share with them what's on your mind. And before we head off, anything that we didn't talk about that you want to make sure our listeners take away from your piece and from your ideas? The first thing that I would say here is to really consider students' mental health. Because I think that school really makes students feel miserable. And if you want to know, you know, really what, what is the evidence that schools, the, the, the system we're talking about, what, what is the evidence that that's really hurting uh, viewpoint diversity or intellectual humility or any of those values that HXA is trying to embody? Um, look at the mental health data. Students are really intensely suffering. And it's not just because of the time that we're in or because of Instagram. It's, it's because they list school as one of their top stressors. And there's actually data showing that students are more likely to attempt suicide when school is in session relative to winter, spring, or summer break. All of these variables that we're talking about, whether it's success in learning and education, viewpoint diversity, intellectual humility, democracy, happiness, all of those things go hand in hand. If your students are miserable, then you probably won't be able to teach them much of anything. Remember that evolution has, to some extent, you know, solved already the problems that we're trying to solve now. Evolution has given us this incredible, wonderful gift of curiosity. Cherish it. Feed your brain what it needs. Study what you love. Dylan Seltzerman on Heterodox Out Loud. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and listen to more thought-provoking takes from our blog authors. For more on the state of free inquiry on college campuses, check out our just-released 2021 Campus Expression Survey on our website, 
at heterodoxacademy.org. Thanks to Davies Content for producing this show and to Kara Boyer on our communications team. I'm Zach Rausch. Until next time. <laughs>